Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pratik Karbachare from Nepal. I represent Freedom Street in Nepal. Uh, it's basically an organization where we teach people how to protest and bring about a uh, uh, tangible legal outcome or a social reform. So basically, it's our youth-led non-profit that integrates art, media, technology, and law. Uh, by profession, I'm a human rights lawyer, and I've just shifted to artivism, this art sector. It's been a quite a while, and I'm liking it. So I'm trying to integrate art and law. And we've, as a freedom studio, we are doing some kind of works that I'll be explaining to you. So basically, there are four key initiatives that Freedom Studio does. And first of it is a movement monitoring mechanism, uh, like you heard it yesterday as well. We have been hearing it. It's basically, imagine it as a where we gather the information and document the records of the protest. And we provide strategic, creative, and legal support for the logical interventions and the support they require. And the second one is the Artivism Lab, like Rita told. The Artivism is the mixture of arts and activism. It is basically a creative space uh, that empowers artists and activists to bring out the pressing and social, uh, that brings out pressing social and political issues by using diverse forms of art and encourage, encourage northern violent resistance in Nepal. The third one is Center for Civic Engagement. Mm, it is more of like an artivism lab. Uh, through this, we are the voice of the voiceless. We bring out the issues uh, through art as well in this, and new media uh, to promote civic engagement, ethical information flow, and uphold the notion of uh, freedom of expression as well. And the last one is advocacy. It's a new thing that we're trying on. It is a mixture of art and advocacy. Uh, we have been quite successful. We have been quite successful to bring out some cases to the court uh, that we have identified through arts in Nepal. So it is a legal activism that we support uh, for a legal support on the issues identified via arts. So now, before I start on the other side, uh, by a quick show of hands, has anyone been to Nepal before? Yeah. That's good. I want to. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's great, and those of you who haven't been there, welcome to <laughs> welcome to this hybrid land of 30 million people and 125 languages and more than 165 ethnicities. So it's a bit of a diverse country in Nepal. So it's sandwiched between India and China, the two big giants, right? So and uh, it is largely famous for mountains. It is largely famous for the birthplace of Gautam Buddha, uh, you might know. And it is also largely famous for the rich cultures that we have. But what you might know, might not know is an issue of an armed conflict, armed conflict of a decade-long armed conflict that happened in Nepal in 1996 and lasted till 2006. And that is the issue that we are currently working on. It's about transitional justice. And uh, as I told you, I'm from a law background, and we are trying to integrate art and law. So in 1996, February 13, it was the start of an armed conflict initiated by the Maoist, which was bound to change the centuries-old history of Nepal. The Maoists were running a one-family, one-member <coughs> policy within the campaign, even involving children, students, teachers, and anyone they could find, or they could threaten, or they could influence. So there was uh, an, another event in June 1, 2002. It is regarded as the Black Day of Nepal. On that day, a royal massacre occurred, killing nine members of the royal family, including the king, queen, in a mass shooting inside the royal palace in the capital city of Kathmandu, adding to the complexity of the already existing situation of the armed conflict. A government-appointed inquiry team concluded that the crown prince was the perpetrator who killed his own family, and he killed himself after shooting all his family members as well. But to this day, the majority of Nepalese doubt the findings and still for search for the truth. It was 2001. Now fast forward to 2006, the comprehensive peace accord was signed between the government of Nepal and struggling Maoist faction, signifying the formal end of the civil war. Crucial elements were included in the 12 points agreement, which you know, included the points such as ceasefire, um, management of the arms as well. And the most importantly, it included um, the point of abolishing the monarchy in Nepal and establishing Nepal as a federal democratic republic. So now let's dissect Nepal's transitional justice journey through the lens of five universally recognized components of transitional justice. The first one is reparation. 
you might know, uh, most of you might know it. The reparation is the basic idea of providing remedies to the victims, understanding harms and compensating for irreparable losses, like losing a family member, losing a father, losing a mother, losing a child, right? What many of the victims, as well as former combatants that were involved in the civil war, are currently involved. They are forced to go in Gulf and work in abroad with their families as well. And um, most of them, majority of them are also dealing with disabilities as caused by the armed conflict. So these victims still seek for positive discrimination, medical treatments, grants, rehabilitation and socialization, which is still pending. The second one is memorialization. It is one of the core aspects that Freedom Studio works with. It is, mem memorialization is basically fostering a culture of peace through public spaces and artistic expression. But it has somehow been um, constricted by the government as well. We tried painting uh, some murals in Kathmandu, but government came the next day and erased it. So we are again protesting uh, against it, but our protest is non violent racist it. So we are finding good ways that we can involve people. The third one is guarantee of non-recurrence. Sorry, it might be boring that I'm trying to get you the history of Nepal, but I think you should learn beforehand the workshop that is happening in the court here. And for the guarantees of non-recurrence, the non-recurrence theory is basically ensuring that those kind of conflict doesn't happen again. What the Prime Minister of Nepal, who is currently the Prime Minister of Nepal, he was a leader of Maoist insurgency, has been speaking in public forums that such kind of conflict might rise again. He's using it as a threat rather than having any remorse to it. So justice is another component of it. Uh, we have been trying to work on this as well. But the legal obligations that they face is de jure and de facto impunity that Nepal has been facing on it. Shortages, prejudice, and lack of political will pose challenge or challenge for the transitional justice process. Families of 70,000 who have been killed during the armed conflict and 1,300 people who are still missing, still look out for justice. And the last one is truth. Nepal struggles with functioning of truth commission. Truth commissions have been established in Nepal after the armed conflict. Despite the establishment of Truth and Reconciliation Commission, over 64,000 applications, complaints have been filed. But uh, amazingly, not even a single application has been furnished. Not even an investigation has begun in context of armed conflict of Nepal. So let's dive into something that Freedom Studio is currently do doing in context of transitional justice. The first project is transitional justice component art project, uh, where we gathered local artists from conflict affected areas and families who used art to talk about injustice, memories, and sufferings of the armed conflict. You might, uh, I have brought in some few arts that have been done by the families of the armed conflict victims as well. So you might have a look at it. These artworks aren't hidden. They have been displayed in public places telling stories of the armed conflict. You can see them, them in our workshop as well, and we have been using it as an art to speak for justice. The second one is advocacy. It is more of a strategic litigation. Supported <coughs> we supported the conflict affected youths to file petitions at Supreme Court demanding justice and accountability from the former Maoist leader who now holds apex, apex position in the country's political structure, one of them being the current prime minister, and we have succeeded to bring out an interim order as well from the court. So the last project is Global Voices for Nepal Justice, and this is where I need your help and support from all of you. There is, there is a big, uh, big cloth canvas hanging around the Pizza Hut. You might want to see it uh, around the venue, signifying the delay, delay in Nepal's transitional justice. I request you all to write a message on it for Nepal. It's more than just a fabric. It's a form of non-violent resistance. It will stand outside Nepal's parliament and Supreme Court as a symbol of global solidarity for justice. Mm -hmm. So after the session, go check it out, write something, be part of a big group that is supporting justice for Nepal. Your words will be like a shout out for Nepal, reminding everyone that we stand together in this world. Uh, <coughs> this is all about Freedom Studio and how we work to promote peace building, especially in context of uh, post-conflict era in Nepal. Now it's time for some experimental session. I want to hear from all, each, all of you. Each of you have a piece of paper in your chair, I guess. Yeah. 
I go. I hope you guys have a pin. So, the paper is a canvas for next few minutes. I want you to sketch something, an issue you feel your country is struggling with in context of peace. It can be anything that comes to your mind or that you feel. Remember that uh, we believe that art is never about perfection or competition. It's always about expression. So feel free to create rough ideas on your paper. Think about your identity in context of peace. What roles do you play on it and how does conflict affect you? That's happening in your country. You can put it out. Your sketch is a voice. And we'll explore these ideas further in our upcoming workshop that is happening in the courtyard uh, later in the day. So we'll have our roughly around about seven minutes. So I want you guys to sketch something that you that has been bothering you or that has been bothering your country. So we have seven minutes. So let's start. Ready, set, and sketch. <laughs> Of you would like to voluntarily participate and share about their art as well. But um, I drew um, in America. There's like, uh, especially since we have a lot of social media, uh, everybody's really quick uh, to point the finger at one another, and they're not really showing uh, showing that brotherly and sisterly love that we should have, um, you know, as people. So I put this um, here. So it's like we're not representing love. That's why I had the heart in the background and um, the point, the fingers on this side and then like the, the girl on the other side. Yeah, yeah it's like can cancel culture, I really hate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you find that the ma majority of the people in Kenya are youth. So this is a representation of the youth uh, down here. Uh, but majority of these youth are jobless, so there's a lot of unemployment, uh, which has led to consumption of drugs. So you find that there's smoking around here. Then we have the political class now. They're using, they're taking advantage of these youth who are um, unemployed, uh, doing weeds and doing some drugs uh, to incite them. Uh, along ethnic ethnic grounds, so they then um, decide to face each other uh, and do a lot of violence. Thank you. I I, I did this. Uh, this uh, shows some spiral, uh, but it has a lot of meaning. And uh, this is also representing uh, the thumbprint uh, that, <clears throat> that, um, that, that is showing our uniqueness. And uh, as, a, as an artist, I did this to represent like, you know, everybody here is unique because of their fingerprint. And that shows your identity. So identities here in Kenya, for example, like we have people from different communities and uh, tribes and uh, in Kenya, we are actually uh, struggling with uh, tribalism, and that is actually causing conflict here because we have those uh, tribes that are that, that rule Kenya. Like for, for instance, right now, um, our president is from the Kalenjin community, and now uh, the Kalenjin community is more dominant than other communities. Initially, we had the Kikuyus, who are actually rivals to Luo, the Luo's. Uh, uh, that, that are represented by the, uh, the, the opposition leader that is right now being done. Then I also uh, use that to also represent tree people who do not accept people, other, other, other opinions from, from different uh, perspectives. Yeah, so this is a representation of that because if that is your unique identity and that's what you want to share with the rest of the people, which may not be true for everyone. We all have come from different religions, different uh, cities, and accommodating that will help us to, to be more tolerant. Yeah, so this uh, was my example of what I want to just share with you. Thank you.
we experience the genocide against the Tutsi, but that has um, root causes in the divisionism, the polarization or politis politization of identities and ethnic. So the consequences of the genocide, they are trauma, and uh, people tend to ignore or to minimize. There are also denial. There are also misunderstanding uh, because it is confused with other things. And that also, uh, they are around the speech of hate, not only in Rwanda, but in the Great Lakes region. And some uh, analysts or uh, actors ignore the roots of the, or the causes of those issues. So they look at the manifestation or the symbol. And um, so the trauma uh, is not only for the generation who experienced the genocide. It's not only trauma, but it, they are also wounds, shame of perpetrators. And those all either shame or either wound, either trauma are transferred to the current generation, to the, to the next generation. There is a misunderstanding and misinformation around the history, the memory, and peace building actors, they are, um, when they don't understand the whole story, the entire story, the approaches are not appropriate um, to those kind of issues. So there is a continuum of violence, even not only in Rwanda, but in the region. There are coalition, negative coalition, negative solidarity. So at the end, I'm working in peace building, but peace education, trying to use trauma-informed peace education, and also to try to influence other approaches to take care of those issues of trauma and the wounds. Thank you. Our major issue that affects peace in Sierra Leone is the kind of government space that we have designed in Sierra Leone. It's not supposed to be so, but it has been designed that way. In fact, last week, this time, Sunday, they attempted a coup, which tells you that our democratic space, we have a system called winner takes all. Even if you have brilliant ideas, as long as you are not coming from the party that is in governance. So another party from another region will then be excluded and then they will refuse to participate in governance. Again, the artists, the comedians that are supposed to be looking into the faces of those in governance, most of them have become politicians. So that is really affecting the country and the youth as well. Most of them, they are unemployed and they've taken to some of the dangerous drugs, especially for Sierra Leone, we have a dangerous drug there called Kush. So in the morning, they will be sleeping. In the afternoon, so we have more sleeping youths than hardworking youths. So this is the major thing affecting my country. A piece of my country, thank you.